Welcome to uh, to DC's daily special as part of the Future of Hospitality Initiative. Uh, we've got the uh, some of you, many of you, not all of you, but most of you possibly are aware that I'm doing a monthly briefing uh, for hospitality business uh, leaders to let you know uh, what's coming around the corner. That's one of the things that we do, the monthly briefing. The next one's on the 5th of September. Um, and we're looking at all the things in the external environment uh, that are basically uh, in front of us on the road ahead. And what I do is I imagine you're driving down the road at night with your dipped headlights on and you're approaching windy roads, what I do is help you put the main beam on to see what the hazards are ahead. Um, and there are some big hazards, and it's like a tsunami all coming together at the same time. So that's the that's the, that's the the briefing, uh, the monthly briefing that's part of this initiative. And then we've got, um, uh, we've got a weekly newsletter, and uh, in the next few hours, Edition number nine is coming out. We've got about 3,500 people following that now. Um, 3,500 hospitality business leaders um, subscribed to the uh, the newsletter that I published through LinkedIn. We're about to move it to some other platforms, or not move it, but share it on some other platforms as well, like Medium. Um, now, the, the, uh, the newsletter that's coming out in the next 24 hours, in the next few hours, um, within the next 24 hours is going to be focused on the subject that I'm talking about today, which is price as a strategic weapon. Um, so, uh, and we'll talk about that in a second. These daily lives sort of support or they're a work in progress <laughs> to uh, support the, uh, the idea of the monthly briefing, making hospitality business leaders aware of the challenges that are coming towards us and the weekly newsletter which breaks down some of those challenges and the strategies that we can put in place um, to mitigate and to tackle uh, those challenges and to in many cases turn them into opportunities for our own businesses to thrive in an environment that's chaotic uncertain volatile and um you know, if we were talking about wild animals, really dangerous um, for the survival of of lots of businesses. So, you know, we've got to be we've got to be really switched on as an industry. If you want to be a player that survives, if you want to be a manager that keeps your 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 company um, uh, prospering into the future, or you're an owner that wants to that wants to make sure their business uh, continues. And they're able. You're able to sell it at some stage in the future for for an amount of money that would um, bring you some prosperity. Then uh, I suggest you listen to how we can manage how we can use price as a strategic weapon, which I'm going to talk about in a second. Now, the reason I'm talking about price today is um, we talk. I talk about price a lot. I've been talking about it since February in um, some of the hospitality conversations that we started in February. That um, became, in April, became the future of hospitality as a result of the conversations that we, the strategic conversations we were having. So, uh, yesterday I ran a masterclass where I shared 25 strategies uh, to help fight uh, the war on inflation and recession. Um, and one of the one of the big themes, uh, two or three of the big themes were things like knowing your numbers, data driven decisions, and price as a strategic weapon. So let's talk about price for a minute. We're in an industry that that has just not been very sophisticated at dealing with price, um, and there's a reason for that, I believe, and and. It dates back just to the way the industry is um, developed out of a high, a highly regulated environment, um, because predominantly the industry sells alcohol, which was a you know go back enough decades. It was a prohibited um, prohibited product. It was a prohibited drug, and uh, and then uh, the authorities effectively licensed it and allowed it to be sold and collected tax on it. Um, 
so what happened what happened with um our industry and there's two there's there's because i'm talking to people in australia and the uk there's there's an interesting um contrast between the way the two um the two countries industries uh hospitality industries have operated on on on, on price in the uk Traditionally, the brewers, up until the 90s when the Beer Orders Act came in and broke the industry up, the brewers uh, controlled about half the pubs, half the 70,000 pubs in the industry. Um, and they they could manage price. And the reason the beer orders uh, broke the industry up and stopped the vertical integration uh, taking place where a handful of brewers owned thousands of pubs each um, the reason, um, the reason, in theory, that that was broken up was to was to stop the fact that a brewer could actually manufacture the product, could wholesale uh, the product, and then sell it through their own outlets. And it was considered that they controlled too much of the market. Um, what then happened was a Japanese bank called Yamura uh, then ended up becoming the biggest pub owner um, in in the uk with over five thousand pubs go figure the banking the banking uh industry owning owning a significant part of any industry there you go what a surprise um so in australia it was a bit different because australia australia didn't have big brewers controlling um half the pubs in the country most of the pubs were family owned they were um they were privately owned independently owned so you, it was an it, it was an owner operator industry. It still is primarily. Um, there's a few groups growing um, in Australia, and I twenty odd years ago, I got headhunted to come out of the UK to Australia to set up what we created as the second largest uh, multi site uh, pub and restaurant group in Australia at that time, and uh, we didn't have we didn't have thousands of pubs. Let me tell you, we. Um, to be the second largest. So it's still owner operated um, predominantly. And what happened in Australia was um, for the for the same reasons that the government collected tax on alcohol, every year the government would make sure its, um, its income from alcohol was indexed linked to inflation and um, the, the excise duty on alcohol was increased every year. And when the excise duty was increased, everybody who who produced, uh, whether they brewed beer or distilled alcohol uh, or created or, or, or made wine, all taxed by the government through excise duty, the increase in excise duty would then flow through to be the annual increase in price. And in Australia, that was generally recommended, a recommended increase in the price of a pot or a schooner or a glass um of, of beer and it was driven by the australian hotels association at a state level and the pub operators would basically um put the price up by the amount that they were the amount that they were um suggested recommended uh to put it up by by um <laughs> sorry my dog's snoring so um so, so that's how it was controlled. It wasn't sophisticated. The operators really didn't have too much influence either in the UK or um, or Australia about about what happened to price. You basically you pri you were told what to sell things for. Now, when when the um, when the industry deregulated in Victoria, in Australia, which was the first state to really deregulate um, hospitality, and instead of a fixed number of um licensed premises which was i think up until the late 80s uh the beginning of the 90s was about i think it was about 1800 pubs in victoria that that, that was the limit to get a new license was really hard it was a regulated industry and controlled and then it became deregulated in the early 90s and the reality is that suddenly uh, everybody could open a bar um without there being without there being a cap on the number of, of places. And then obviously cafes, um, cafes followed, um, which weren't regulated uh, anyway by alcohol, but but the whole coffee market expanded. So we've got lots of cafes, we've got lots of bars, we've 
got lots of pubs. And then other states in Australia opened up, New South Wales opened up. In the UK, um, the, the breakdown of the control by brewers of the pub industry then turned into uh, lots of lots more groups, particularly groups um, forming um, that were privately owned, much smaller, except for Numura Bank, of course, the Japanese bank that owned more than 5,000 pubs. Um, and then what happened in the UK was you got the advent of micro pubs because the, the industry deregulated. But out of out of the true almost the tradition, right? It's come from nowhere other than tradition that price would be pushed through the industry generally by um, an, an excise duty increase from government. And a little bit would then be added on every year, generally. Now, in Australia, what happened was that once the once the industry deregulated, and this was particularly the case in Victoria, um, the Australian Hotels Association really stopped suggesting that a particular increase per pot of beer, um, pot for those of you in the UK, is uh, is not another um, dr drug of choice. A pot is the size of a glass of beer. Um, a glass being the size of a glass in Queensland and a schooner being the size of a glass in uh, New South Wales. Now, uh, in the UK, it's a pint, right? That's really easy. Um, anyway, we, we digress. That might be the subject of another, um, another daily live at some point in the future. But we've basically, we've had this highly controlled environment. And, and what we what we've what we've so, so we've come out of that environment and then as things deregulated um and, and i'll use victoria as the example the australian hotels association as such didn't have the same influence over um the the restricted number of 1800 or whatever it was pubs uh, that used to exist and suddenly you've got thousands and thousands and thousands of outlets um more than five thousand in the in the city of melbourne alone and they weren't all members of the Australian Hotel Association. Um, price, it was much more competitive marketplace. So price starts to become more controlled by the individual operators, many of whom didn't dare put their prices up against their competitors because their customers might uh, go somewhere else if they put their prices up. So price was then price was then really market driven, and, and often people wouldn't put their put, wouldn't put their price up. Um, now. Contrast that to the airline industry. Let's compare it with the airline industry. So in the airline industry, you've got a situation very similar to restaurants, right? I know in, in a restaurant, say, um, on a Wednesday night, say you've got 100 seats in your restaurant. You can sell them either once or twice, right? Or three times if you're if you're if you're really good the reality is you can sell them let's say two, let's say two and a half times so you've got 250 potential seats that you that you're selling in your restaurant on a wednesday night now on thursday if you didn't if you had some empty seats on wednesday you can't on thursday sell your wednesday night seats right you're not producing widgets in a factory that sit in a warehouse. And if you don't sell them Wednesday, you can actually still sell them on a Thursday. Now, in the airline industry, you've got a flight. That flight takes off. Once it's taken off or once it's 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 just before it's taken off, it's basically the doors have closed and they've sold all they've sold as many tickets as they're going to sell. Once it's once it's once the doors are closed and it's about to take off. You can't put anybody else on it. So what the airline industry is really good at, and they're, they're absolutely amazing at, is managing price. Because what they want to do is to make sure every seat is sold. And what they're trying to do is to maximize the gross margin that they make on their airplane. They want to, they, they want to make sure that they, they're making as much money from that single flight as they possibly can. Now, what that means is they they change the price by different locations in the aeroplane. They change the price 
by the time that you actually book your flight in advance of the flight. They change their flight by the actual type of seat you're sitting in and whether you've got a bit more space or you're a bit more crammed up. Now, imagine, imagine that in restaurants. So what you'd actually do is the seats by the toilets would be cheaper than the seats by the window where people can see that you're eating in the restaurant. The, if you booked three weeks before to sit in that seat on that particular night, you'd pay a different price than somebody who may be booked the day before. And if you had a table of four that only two of you were sitting at, you might pay more for each of those two seats than if they were four. Now, we couldn't even comprehend that, right? We couldn't even comprehend that. It's just not the way things are done in our industry. We can't imagine that people really would pay a different price for spaghetti bolognese at the front of the restaurant than they would at the back of the restaurant. We don't really imagine that people would pay a different price for spaghetti bolognese if they booked it three weeks before the day they consumed it or two days before they consumed it. We don't imagine that somebody would pay more for spaghetti bolognese if they were sitting at a table that could seat four people, but there were only two of them, than if there were four people sitting at that table. Now, I'm not suggesting we do any of those things. I'm just giving you a comparison of two different industries and the way they manage price. And what I would suggest to you is that price in the airline industry is used as a strategic weapon. Price in the airline industry is, is a sophisticated uh, process to maximize profitability. And in our industry, we just don't necessarily do that. Now, what I focused on yesterday in the masterclass when we talked around uh, price is that we're in this environment where inflation is, is suddenly, um, for the first time in 20 or 30 years or longer, at the levels we're going to with inflation, um, we've, got, we've got some real challenges. And the impact of inflation makes us, actually forces us to think about price much more carefully. And the basics of that are that beef per kilo went up 5% yesterday. Do we add something onto the dishes that we have that have got beef in it? Now, that's the level of sophistication we're at at the moment in our industry. Now, four or five months ago, when I started doing the monthly briefings, um, the monthly briefings uh, for Future of Hospitality, and talking about the risks heading towards us. Inflation at that point wasn't seen as a major issue uh, only four or five months ago. Um, inflation was a little bit higher than the two or 3% that it had been at for decades, two, at least two decades. And um, it wasn't really a concern now we were flagging it as part of the future of hospitality briefings. We were talking about inflation looking like it was going to be a threat to the industry in the next three to 12 months. And I'd say we called it pretty well. And I'll just show you, um, this is the, this is, and, and this is how out of control inflation is. This is, this is the bank of England and it's, projections or forecasts on inflation um, at different points. So each of these colored lines that you can see is um, a revised uh, forecast, no more than a few weeks uh, apart. Each forecast is no more than a few weeks apart. And it shows you, it shows you how, this is the Bank of England, they're, prime, they're, they're the central bank of the UK. 
Um, the RBA is the central bank in Australia, and they've got the same job. They're supposed to um, implement policy, which is generally around interest rates and the way bonds are dealt with, um, and pushing money into the economy, or what they're now doing for the pretty much almost the first time in 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 such circumstances, uh, tightening uh, tightening money supply. They're they're just way out. They've got they've got no they've got no idea what they're doing. Um, this the the essentially the CEO of the Bank of England, the governor of the Bank of England, who by the way is paid five hundred and seventy five thousand pounds a year, um, has got this completely wrong. And in any com other commercial environment, I mean the Bank of England's a private company. It's not a government institution. Um, the RBA is a private company. It's not a government institution. Any other private company where the CEO got the no, the numbers so wrong, um, they'd have gone by now, and somebody else would have replaced them. Um, for some reason, governors of central banks um, that doesn't happen to them. Um, they can just get it wrong. Now, one of the things that I want to highlight to you here is not just the absolute absurdity of the um, of the lack of ability to forecast accurately. And the demonstration that inflation is just out of control. Um, what I want to, what I want you to look at is not just the the line going up. I want you to look at their forecast of the line coming down. All right. So the central banks are telling us that, um, despite the fact that they have absolutely got every forecast wrong for the last six months about that what the level of inflation would reach, what what would what it would go to, they're telling us that in 12 months time-ish, um, 12 to 24 months, but in 12 months, inflation is just going to crash. It's just going to come down. It's not going to be a problem. So don't worry. Now, this is the this is the message that's going out through the media. Oh, yeah, inflation's out of control, but it's going to be okay in 12 or 24 months. It'll be back down. Well, they've just got it wrong. You can see how many times they've got it wrong going up. Why on earth would we believe that they're going to be right at when it comes down and what it's going to come down to? So what I'm encouraging, I certainly encourage my clients and I, my mentoring clients, and I certainly um, would encourage you, I'd encourage you to imagine that that line's not coming down as fast as it looks like it's coming down on these charts and that, um, and that you're going to be facing inflation for a, a lot longer uh, and a lot higher uh, than these guys, these central bank experts. Governor of the Bank of England paid £575,000. The governor of the Reserve Bank of Australia, the RBA, paid over a million Australian dollars to get it this wrong. The words escape me. The word Muppet comes to mind. Other than that, Words escape me. Um, so, so what what I'm what I'm encouraging you to do is to um, is to see some of these issues as going on longer than we're sort of being told. They might just be a spike. So, uncertainty, volatility are going to continue, and inflation may well. I'm not telling you any certainties, but I'm suggesting that you you plan for the worst and you hope for the best. You don't you don't hope um, you don't just live in hope, right? That the governors of the central banks who've got it so wrong in the last few weeks are so right about what's going to happen next year. So get your act together around pricing. Understand how you can use pricing as a strategic weapon. And what that means is being really careful about just adding on price. Six months ago, the main issue in the industry was that um, hospitality business leaders in general, not everybody, but most, weren't actually pushing prices up with the cost prices going up to them. And now a few months later everybody not everybody most not all um most hospitality business leaders have really had to if they've if they've survived to this point they've they've been they've put their prices up 
particularly on food ingredients, right? So, so people are starting to push their prices up and feeling comfortable, and I'm going to say too comfortable, that um, customers are accepting it. Now, they will accept it for a period of time. But let me show you what's happening in the supermarket industry in Europe. Now, this is an essential purchase food um, and, and purchases from supermarkets uh, compared with what, in general terms, is considered a discretionary purchase or a purchase out of a consumer's discretionary spending, um, which is a hospitality spend, a meal in a restaurant, a drink at a pub, a coffee in the morning from your cafe. So what what this is telling us is that, and this is this is um, this is data from um, around about April to June, so April to June, three months in Europe, but it's it gives us an indication, certainly gives us an indication for the UK because it's in there, and it gives us an indication what might happen in Australia and the US as well. So twenty, what this is telling us is that twenty five percent of consumers in that three months, switched from their regular brand of supermarket that they were loyal to or their speciality grocery store or the convenience store that they bought their food from or the hypermarket, and they moved to discounters. Now, this is massive. This is absolutely unprecedented. A shift of this level in such a short, short space of time suggests that Consumers are significantly impacted by rising prices and the fear of future continued rising prices. And what they're doing is looking for better value for money. And value for money is what we'll talk about in several of the sessions that, um, that, that we've got coming up. But from a pricing point of view, um, if you continue just to add on price, and let's say you end up with the you end up with the most expensive spaghetti bolognese um, in the world um, because you've just kept adding on uh, the cost price increases. You will come to a point where your customers, um, your custom, your customers, get a bit pissed off with um, the price they're paying for something, and they think they can get a better deal somewhere else. Now, I'm not saying they'll get a better deal somewhere else. What I am telling you is they'll get pissed off and they'll actually start looking elsewhere for better value for money. Now, what they'll look at is some of the deals that are being offered by other competitors of yours and they'll go and try them. Now, they might get a better deal. They might feel that they're getting better value for money. What they will probably get is an is an absolute value of their spend, the number of dollars they're spending will be less because they've been attracted by a particular offer. It'll be less than the price of your expensive spaghetti bolognese. Now, what we've got to, what we've got to do in the industry is understand that we've just gone through this period of time where in an industry where we, we collectively have been quite unsophisticated about the way we've managed price. We've suddenly got into this confidence level of pushing cost prices up. And so far, for most people, consumers of our customers have accepted that we're putting prices up because they're hearing in the media all the time about prices going up. So they, you know, to a degree, there's some compassion to a degree. There's a bit of empathy. There's a bit of acceptance that, you know, what they pay is going to be more than what they paid a month ago for their spaghetti bolognese. But what's going to happen um, if we continue just to keep pushing prices up as our cost prices go up is that we're, we're, going, to, we're going to upset. We're going to piss off. We're going to push some of, our, some of our customers to go and find better pricing elsewhere. Now, um, Imagine if 25% of your customers switched to another competitor, somebody who was offering what was perceived to be better value for money. What would that do to your business? Now, 
I'm going to end it here. I'm just introducing the concept of price as a strategic weapon, I'm giving you some, I've given you some background. I've given you some scenarios. I've explained that we've got this, um, I've explained where we've come from in terms of pricing. And tomorrow I will talk to you about the way we can actually use, use price strategically to create value for money propositions that not only retain our current customers, but also help attract those customers that are starting to wander around looking for better value where they've left other places because the prices have just been pushed up. So I hope you join me for that. And um, I'm going to call it quits now because I've reached my 30 minutes and I've introduced the subject and I'll continue to talk about this subject all week. In fact, I'll probably be talking about it all year. <laughs> Thanks, guys. See you soon.